Thank God it's Friday. Jimmy here in Chicago. Hope everybody had a productive week. Got a really cool story tonight. We're going to talk about some of the Chicago Outfit made members and associates. Maybe around half a dozen of them that have been convicted for violent crimes and are doing life sentences or football numbers in prison. These men, blue trial, never cooperated, never flipped, never snitched or ratted on their friends, stood up, were models prisoners, did their time, and it's time we bring some of these guys home. They're no longer a threat to society. Their outfit mob gangster days are well behind them. It's time the government releases these men who have served their time. They've paid their debt to society. It's time to bring them home to their families. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. If you like my Chicago mob trial stories, please hit the like button. Subscribe, share with your friends. I appreciate all the comments. Now, before we get started, I want to point out my backdrop. Do you see there that old rundown building right there with the gray painted windows? That's the old Boomerang Club or the Survivors Club, they call it. That's the old social club in my neighborhood right there. On Grand in May, just west of downtown Chicago, across the street from Bari Foods and Diamato's Bakery. Years ago, this was Joe Lombardo's club. He went to prison. Mikey Switek took it over. This was an active club, one of the oldest social clubs in Chicago. And I remember in the late 1990s, you could go by here seven days a week. And on any given day, there'd be anywhere from five to 15 to 30 guys all hanging out, cooking, playing cards, <laughs> busting balls, and watching the girls go by. Inside the club, they had a couple couple tables, nothing real fancy. Then a photo, a black and white photo of Marilyn Monroe. And if you look closely, she wasn't wearing any panties, and you could see a little bush. So Frex, Dominic Clarko, the guy that ran the club, World War II Army vet, he put a couple pieces of electrical tape to cover up Marilyn Monroe's private parts. They also had an old-fashioned wooden, almost like an antique uh, phone booth, enclosed phone booth, where they used to make bets out of. This place has been raided many times back in the 70s, 80s. When Joey Lombardo was on the lam, this was one of the first places that they went to, looking for him, asking questions. Nobody knew where he was. But there's a lot of history here. Till this day, I'm still trying to get the phone booth out of the club from the owner before he sells this place. But he keeps ghosting me. But this is it. This is the old Survivor Club. They had the little sign on the door, members only. Fast forward early 2000s, towards the remaining days of the club, I would deliberately walk my daughter. She was like two, three years old. I would walk her deliberately past the club. So she could get all the attention from some of the wise guys. They would yell at me to get that nookie out of her mouth. A couple of the guys would buy her ice cream and cookies from the bakery next door. But this is the old club. Unfortunately, uh, it's closed. And now they're probably trying to turn it into a, a, a high-end restaurant or another condominium building. But let's get into tonight's story. We're going to talk about some of the men in my personal opinion that need to be released from prison and sent home to their families. Top of the list, we got Nick Geo. 
This is Juan Tough Son of a Bitch here. I actually seen him in court in the early 1990s at the Gus Alex trial. Looks like an NFL linebacker. But Nick Geo, he was a, um, you know, the usual, a burglar, career thief. He was a debt collector, fierce enforcer, and kind of like a wannabe. Now, going back to 1987, he was 27 years old, been in and out of jail, burglary, theft, weapon charges, you know, the usual. A girlfriend of his loaned this um, salon owner $17,000. Guy's name was John Castellano. He owned two salons in Chicago. I think it was River Forest, right in the North Harlem area, not too far from where uh, Tony Ocardo and some of the outfit bosses lived. This salon owner owned a couple salons. Guess he got a little greedy. He borrowed money from one of Nick Geo's friends. She loaned him the money, and then he fucked her over. He ghosted her. Push came to shove. He made a couple smart-ass comments to her about her and Nick Geo. Fast forward, Nick Geo and two associates gunned this man down, shot and killed him right there in Bellwood. They dumped the gun right off of uh, 290. So Nick Geo was charged with that murder. I don't remember who the two associates were. But if anybody knows, please let me know in the comments because the two guys that were with Nick when he killed the hairdresser, they flipped and cooperated. They testified against him. So they had two witnesses that flipped. They also found the gun, the murder weapon. They found in Bellwood right off the 290 Expressway. But that evidence and the motive uh, convicted Nick Geo. Now, fast forward early 1990s the very first trial that i ever went to was the gus alex trial i'll never forget it gus alex was 76 years old at the time high ranking chicago outfit boss right under tony arcardo joy upa they charged gus alex with receiving kickbacks from lenny patrick's very violent extortion crew Lenny Patrick, gambling lieutenant on the north side, real nasty guy. Um, goes back to Al Capone days. But Lenny Patrick had a crew of James Lavelli, Panda, they called him, Mario Renone, and this guy here, Nick Geo. These guys were going into car dealerships, restaurants, and other businesses in the northwestern, northern suburbs and demanding hundreds of thousands of dollars and threatening violence. I mean, just imagine a young, tough Nick Geo and a guy like Mario Renone showing up unannounced at your office one day. Some of these guys enjoyed violence. They liked it when the guys didn't pay because that, that got them a chance to shine. But Nick Geo was part of that extortion crew. He was, even though he was in custody on the hairdresser's murder, Nick Geo, blue trial, he could have easily informed and testified against James Lavelli, Mario Renone, and Gus Alex, Lenny Patrick, but he didn't. He blew trial and was convicted on that. This guy here is now serving uh, life in prison, I believe. At first, he got shipped off to uh, the notorious Leavenworth, Leavenworth Penitentiary, Leavenworth, Kansas. And I think now he's in uh, Danville. Uh, the judge that presided over his sentence was a guy named Marvin Loom, Bloom. And then he had Assistant State's Attorney Patrick O'Malley. But they had a solid case. Like I said, they found the murder weapon. Two of the guys that were with him that night, 
when he shot and killed John Castellano. They flipped. But here's a guy, I, the reason I bring him up, in my opinion, his outfit days are over. He's no longer a threat to society. He showed remorse. I think he's spent over 40 years in prison. It's time to bring Nick Gio home to his family and friends. Last note on uh, Nick Gio. Some people thought that early on he tried to cooperate. I don't remember the details, but obviously he he never did. Stand-up guy, in my opinion. Um, also, I want to mention, when I seen him, I think it was in 1992 at the Gus Alex trial, this guy looked like an NFL running back. I mean, muscular, big forearms, big biceps. His neck was like a fucking horse. And I remember how he catered to the elderly Gus Alex. He would help him up, help him walk, pour him coffee, pour him water. Really showed respect for the elder statesman. Nick Geo even asked, through his lawyer, asked the judge if he, if he could be housed in the same unit at the MCC so he could look after and take care of um, us, Alex. And the judge told him to um, shut his mouth and let his lawyer do the talking. But this is Nick Geo, Chicago outfit, associate, young guy, 27 years old, uh, wannabe, got mixed up, ended up killing a guy. He could easily gave that guy a beating or could extort extorted money out of him, but he felt disrespected. He had him killed. He killed him himself and unfortunately uh, locked up for the rest of his life. But I think uh, it's time, as crazy as it sounds, to send this man home. Now we'll keep going. Nobody more deserves compassion release than this man here, Jimmy Marcello. At one point, he was underboss of Chicago Outfit, uh, Sam Carlisi's right-hand man. Fast forward, he actually became boss of Chicago Outfit. I've seen Jimmy Marcello twice in person. First was at the Sam Carlisi trial. Carlisi trial was in the early 1990s. Sam Carlisi's entire crew got pinched for a RICO case. The, the usual, extortion, gambling, loan sharking, attempted murder, fire bombings. Um, Jimmy Marcello, blue trial, stood up, never ratted, never rolled, did uh, double-digit years in prison uh, for the Carlisi trial pinch. Finally comes home to his family. I think he's only home for maybe three months, four months. Gets a knock on the door. The feds indict him for a couple murders at the family secrets trial. Can you imagine that? You do 15 odd years in prison. You finally come home three months later. You get pinched again. We all know about Jimmy Marcello and his legacy in the Chicago outfit. But Nick Calabrese flip-flopped when he testified against Jimmy. At first, when Nick Calabrese sat down with the feds after they um, let him know that we found his DNA on the John Thackerata bloody glove and that his nephew, Junior, was going to testify, at first, Nick lied to the FBI. He said that Thackerata picked up him and Jimmy LaPetria at the Venture parking lot and drove them to the house in Bensonville where the Splotcher brothers were killed. He never mentioned Jimmy Marcello as the driver that picked them up. But then Nick changed his mind, slept on it, thought to himself he better come clean with the agents. So the next morning when Nick debriefed with the agents, he said that it was Jimmy Marcello that picked them up in a real fancy van. He picked up John Thackerata, Jimmy LaPetria, and Nick Calabrese and dropped them off at the house in Bensonville where the Spalatro brothers were brutally 
beaten, stomped to death. The government was also able to prove through um, Mikey Marcello's daughter, wife, and a, a, a payphone, a bug phone or a payphone or something, that Jimmy Marcello, a man named Jim, called asking to speak to Michael Splatro before he left for that meeting, and he was never seen again. But the government alleged that Jimmy Marcello was the one that set up Splatro's to be killed. Now, one interesting thing a lot of people don't know about, two of the 14 murders that Nick Calabrese testified that he participated in, that he testified against, were the Strangers in the Night murders. That was a burglar and one of his friends who just happened to be at the wrong place at the right time, wrong place, wrong time. One of the guys they wanted to question in the uh, Tony Ricardo break-ins. These gentlemen were uh, jumped. They were lured to a bar that was closed. They were jumped, beaten, and strangled. And the region they called it Strangers in the Night is the song Strangers in the Night was playing on the jukebox. <laughs> so imagine these two poor bastards getting strangled and beat to death with that amazing song Strangers in the Night playing in the background. But the Calabrese brothers would refer to that as Strangers in the Night. But the jury did not believe that Jimmy Marcello was part of that murder. However, Judge Zagel, the federal judge that presided over the family secrets trial, he overread that verdict and believed Nick Calabrese and believed that Jimmy Marcello did indeed participate in the Strangers in the Night murder. But that screams appeal to me. How could the jury acquit him on two murders? The judge disagrees with the jury's verdict and overrules that. Bottom line, Jimmy Marcello was locked up for life. For some reason, the feds really wanted to stick it to him. They sent him to ADX Supermax. Many, many miles from home, from his family in Chicago. This man is a family man. He is no longer the boss of Chicago Outfit. He has nothing to do with anything in organized crime. He's paid his debt to society. He's getting up there in age. I'm sure he's got some health issues. There was a little bit of reasonable doubt in Nick Calvary's testimony. But Jimmy Marcello, in my humble opinion, has served enough time in prison. He's no longer a threat. His outfit days are long behind him. It's time to bring this man home to his family. And here's where they send alleged boss to Chicago outfit, ADX Supermax. You got Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, was here. Sammy the Bull. Ramsey Youssef. The Shoe Bomber, Richard Reed. Other terrorists from 911. This is the worst of the worst. There's no reason James Marcello needs to spend one more night in this prison cell. This is an actual um, photo of one of the rooms at ADX Supermax. What do you guys think? Do you think Jimmy Marcello has served enough time? Now we're going to keep going here. Mark Poltzman. If you saw this guy in the street, you would think he's he's a, just a regular guy, right? Businessman, construction guy. You're looking at a high-ranking outlaw motorcycle gang member. Mark Polchman, I went to his trial. He was a co-defendant with Mike Large Guy Sarno. Basically, Sarno, Polchman, and the crew... They had a very sophisticated burglary crew. They were doing home and business burglaries. The city of Chicago, the suburbs surrounding Midwestern states. And they were selling the stolen merchandise. They were fleecing the stolen merchandise through a pawn shop, a front pawn shop he had in Cicero called Goldberg Jewelers. I drive by there all the time on Roosevelt and Cicero. It's still there today. There's a currency store next door. 
But during the investigation, this guy here, he was caught on tape saying he's not doing anything wrong, meaning he's not involved in drugs. He's not involved in guns. He didn't think that the feds would be interested in, in some of the fleecing going on. But man, was he wrong. Because what got the feds' attention was the bombing charge. As we all know, any arson bombing is an automatic 25 years, especially if you link the words OC, organized crime, to that indictment. The What happened was um, when Jimmy Marcello went to prison, him and his brother controlled Eminem Amusement. They had pretty much a stranglehold, a monopoly on all your video poker machines and all your bars and restaurants in the city and suburbs, right? So when Jimmy Marcello and his brother went away in the Family Secrets trial, Mike Sarno took over that, that racket. And one of his competitors was a Spanish guy, real punk, we'll call this kid VD. And he had a lot of his machines in some of Sarno, Sarno's um, places of business. Sarno warned him many times to get his machines out. Mark Polkman, another high-ranking motorcycle guy, this guy was probably fucking three, 400 pounds, went in there, trashed the place up biker style to send him a message. He still wasn't back, backing down. Finally, VD, the competitor in the poker business, him and Large got in an argument. He disrespected Large, and that was it. According to the government, Mike Sarno gave the job to this guy here, Mark Polkman, the government's informant, Mark Hay, Volpendenzo Jr., and Volpendenzo Sr., Samuel Volpendenzo Sr., he actually was on tape bragging about the bomb that he made. A witness seen Mark Polkman driving a brown van in Berwyn. They blew up a, a, a competitor. This was the uh, damage that the bomb did. Government did not only brought in photos of the aftermath, but they brought in evidence of charred brick and broken glass to show um, the real damage a bomb can do. But this was a nonviolent crime, meaning nobody got hurt. They blew up the place at night knowing nobody would be in there. But Mike Sarno got 25 years because the government believed he was the leader of the crew. But the evidence against Mike Sarno was a little flimsy. All of it was mostly against Samuel Volpendenzo, his son, Anthony Volpendenzo, Mark Hay, and the other informant. I'm forgetting his name. Two informants of that crew ratted, wore a wire, and snitched on everybody else. Everybody at the Mike Sarno trial was found guilty. They even had an ATF uh, agent that uh, became good friends with Mark Polkman. And um, they built a relationship. And Mark Polkman had no idea uh, that the guy was an ATF agent. But at first, Mark Polkman got 60 years. He was shocked at the sentence because, again, there was nobody got killed, no drugs, no guns aside from the bomb, then they, he got to reduce the 40. This guy, you would never know that he's an outlaw motorcycle gang member by his appearance. He looked like one of the lawyers. But don't let his looks fool you. I'd like to see this guy come home one day. He could have easily informed and ratted against Mike Sarno, the government's big fish, but he didn't. He blew trial, got convicted. His lawyer, Damien, Sharonis represented him, but there was a lot of evidence against him, and unfortunately, he was um, given a 40-plus year sentence. I think he's learned his lesson. He served his time. His outlaw motorcycle gang days are long behind him. It's time to bring Mark Polkman home. Part of that case, Mike Sarno. This was the government's big fish, large made member Chicago outfit. He came up under the tutelage of Bobby Salerno. Unfortunately, Large was convicted. The jury believed 
uh, the government's low-life informant, Mark Hay, same informant that actually stabbed an old man in the in the uh, leg because the old man was beating him up. The old man caught him in a uh, rob in his house, and the lowlife actually stabbed a senior citizen in the leg to break free. But this is the kind of lowlifes they use to go after guys like Mike Sarno. Uh, he got convicted. I think he got 20, 25 years uh, for being the leader of that crew and uh, giving the green light to bomb one of his competitors. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of evidence against Large other than a couple uh, of the guys on tape referring to him as the boss. Um, but Large was very paranoid, very cautious. Uh, this man has some serious health issues. hes I believe he's not even in a, a, hosp- uh, a jail anymore. I think he's in, um, in a federal hospital, federal prison hospital. Uh, but it's time that Mike Sarno gets compassionate release. They should have released him during COVID. He has some serious health issues. It's time that he comes home to his family. His family loves and misses him so much. I remember seeing his wife, kids, his son, all in court, crying, supporting him. Uh, This is a good man here. Uh, He's done enough time in prison. It's time to bring Mike Sarno home. I think he still has maybe a slight chance to get an early parole. God bless Mike Sarno and his family. Now, here's a guy, uh, an old friend of mine, Bobby uh, Bobby Pinozo. Now, I always liked Bobby, but I had no idea what he was involved in. Um, you know, obviously, he led a very dangerous crew called the PK Crew. Uh, I would have really, I was really looking forward to going to his trial because it's very seldom that I actually know the defendant at a trial. <laughs> But unfortunately, uh, it never went to trial. But we all know the PK crew, him, Polly, Polly's wife, his son, and uh, another guy who was like an uh, electronics genius. They were basically pulling off four, five, six major scores a year. They were robbing um, drug dealers, stash houses, um, wealthy people from the East Bank Club. They even robbed a couple cops and judges. But they were posing as... Uh, undercover Chicago policemen, they did raids, they would rob guns, drugs, cash, get away with it. Um, but I had no idea that that Bobby was involved in that until years later. But uh, he could have easily flipped and rolled on some of the people that he's affiliated with, uh, but he didn't. This guy was looking at a life in prison. I thought when I first saw the indictment, I thought he's never coming home. But sure, slowly but surely, uh, the main defendant, Paulie K, he's home. I just seen him in Smith Park at the 4th of July fireworks show. Um, his wife, Bobby's son, uh, and the uh, the other guy, I'm forgetting his name, their electronics guy, they were using GPSs to track some of their ops. They would put GPSs on their ops cars so they would know when's a good place to rob the stash houses. Very sophisticated crew, unfortunately. Uh, that lowlife Jeff Hollingsworth and his girlfriend, uh, they snitched and ratted and brought down the whole crew. But he's done enough. He's served enough time. Uh, hopefully, Bobby P. has learned his lesson, and it's time to bring him home. Um, Bobby P., I was worried about him because, you know, being locked up in the Cook County Jail, and where they sentenced him to, um, you know, he's somewhat of a, a target because of some of the gangbangers and stash houses that he was ripping off. That's a very, very dangerous uh, hobby to have. But let's bring home Bobby P., bring him back to the neighborhood. This guy had uh, all kinds of one-liners. He was liked and respected by everybody in the Grand Avenue neighborhood, especially Joey the Clown Lombardo. Lumpy gave him the name Pinocchio because he liked the way Bobby lied and was kind of like a con man. I heard from a couple of my friends that he was the lookout on a couple scores with Lumpy Kozo, Mikey Switek back in the day. Um, This is a great man here. Good man, Bobby P. Let's bring him home. Now, here's a guy you might be uh, not really a Chicago outfit guy, but one of the biggest one of the most powerful 
shot callers, gang leaders in the country, especially back in the day, you got Larry Hoover. Larry Hoover was the king, the president of one of the largest, most violent, most dangerous street gangs in the country. Forget about the East Coast and the Crips and Bloods on the West Coast. None of them had nothing compared to Hoover during his peak. They controlled the entire South Side. They operated out of the Robert Taylor homes right across the street from White Sox Park. 30,000 street soldiers, hundreds of murders, very violent. Hoover got pinched years ago on a case which could have been a self-defense case. He ended up killing one of his ops, a rival gangster, but that was a good case for a, a good defense. He could have easily got killed himself. So what does the government do? Rather than send a man like this to a maximum security prison, they send Hoover to Vienna, a minimum security prison. Hoover ran the entire prison. He had access to every room in the jail. He had access to food, drugs, women, whatever he wanted. He ran the entire Vienna compound. The only thing he couldn't do was leave. So Hoover was running the BGDs from his prison cell. I went to his trial in the 1990s. I'll never forget it. It was him, a beautiful black female Chicago police officer, Sonia Irvin, her boyfriend, Gregory Shell, Shorty G, Hoover's right-hand man, and maybe four or five other high-ranking GDs. To see all these guys in the courtroom, these high-ranking OGs, old heads, these men were look like NFL football players, right? Big, tough guys. They were running a $100 million a year drug operation. Uh, the prosecutor said in op opening statements they made more money than U.S. Steel. Here's Gregory Schell, a.k.a. Shorty G, Larry Hoover, and I forget the other gen gentleman's name. But these gentlemen would visit Hoover in prison the government put an ultra-thin transmitter in the visitor's pass and picked up hours and hours of conversations. They talked in code. Nobody had any idea what they were talking about, so the government hired an Ivy League black FBI female agent. She spent thousands of hours breaking down the code. They had an elaborate code. They would talk about football, baseball scores when they would refer to different different street uh, different areas in the in the hood, they would refer to uh, cocaine as chicken. They would talk in opposite genders, similar to some of the mob guy talk that Frank Calabrese um, was known for, talking in code. But when the government agent broke down the code, it was quite obviously what they were doing. Hoover was ordering murders uh, on his ops. He was also extorting every drug dealer that wasn't a GD. Every single one that wasn't part of his clique had to pay up to him. But it was unbelievable. All the defendants were found guilty. The evidence was overwhelming. Um, and the, the female defendant, she was a Chicago cop, they charged her with conspiracy, meaning she had to know her boyfriend, the vice president of the gang, she had to know what he was up to. Uh, she had several chicken and fish restaurants on the south side that the gang was running their drug operation from. All the defendants were found guilty, but Hoover, some people think he's turned his life around, and I believe he's no longer a threat. I think his gangbanging days are long gone. I think maybe some of the shorties, some of the younger gangs will listen to him and get off the streets, join the military, go to school learn a trade. I think Hoover, if he was released, could do something positive for the inner city. But the government doesn't think so. They think he is still a danger. They think he is still the leader of the Black Gangster Disciples. But this man has been in jail pretty much his entire life. A lot of other people, celebrities, VIPs are trying to get him out as well. I don't think they're going to ever let Larry Hoover out of prison, but this is the man, in my opinion, uh, he's paid for his crimes, and it's time for him to come home. Now let's switch over to the East Coast. 
We got Vinny Gorgeous. I can't think of anybody that got fucked over more than this guy. We all know Chicago or New York crime boss, Fat Joey Messino. He blew trial, was found guilty, several murders. Then he decided to fucking flip and cooperate to save all his millions and to protect his family. Smart move on his move. But he ran on a lot of his family and friends. His brother-in-law was a cop, also a fucking member of the Bananos. He flipped and ratted. But Joe Messina actually wore a wire on his street boss, Vinnie Gorgeous, tricking him, conning him, enticing him to talk about murders. Vinny had no idea that his boss, Joe Messino, would ever flip and cooperate, especially after blowing trial. And unfortunately, they got him on tape talking about past murders. If it wasn't for some of these government informants, rats, snitches, a lot of these cases would have never went to court. A lot of these men would have never got convicted. But this is Vinny Gorgeous. You can see why they, what a handsome man, built guy. It's time to, time to send this man home as well. Bring back Vinny Gorgeous. And then you got another New York mob boss, Vic Amuso. That was a very dangerous man back in the day. But look at this guy. Look how frail he is. This reminds me of Joe Lombardo at 78 when he was convicted. Or Gus Alex at 76 when the feds took him away in handcuffs. This man is frail. He has health issues. Vic Amuso is no longer a threat. But it's amazing he survived all the wars in New York with the five families. Stand-up man to the very end. This, this guy, like a lot of the other guys we're talking about, are no longer threats. It's time to bring them home. Even if you got to put them on house arrest, home monitoring, bring some of these Outfit guys, New York, Philly, mob guys, made associates, guys that have served football numbers in prison. Time to bring these home. Time to bring these men home. Do you agree or not, right? I mean, there's people that committed way worse crimes than this that did 10, 15, 20 years and are released. Last but not least, I want to share with you guys some merch. If you guys are interested, send me your shirt size, shipping address. My shirts go anywhere between $40 and $50 because they're custom. My favorite shirt, you got the Last Supper. We all know this photo here. You got Joey Iupa, Boss Chicago Alpha, Dominic DeBella, Vince Solano. El Pilato, Jack Cerrone, Joe Lombardo, Turk Torello, Cesar DeVarco, Black Joe, and Tony Arcardo. You're looking at some of the most powerful, most dangerous men in the country back in their day. This is the Last Supper shirt. Then here you got the Capone brothers. Al Capone, his little brother, Ralphie Bottles Capone, showing them as little kids growing up. Another shirt for sale. Here I got a mugshot of a Chicago outfit boss, Sam Wings Carlisi. Another one. This is a popular one. The Wild Bunch. You got Harry Elman, Scarpelli, Jimmy Icepick, Tony Borsellino, Butchie Petroselli, and Scalise. Another popular shirt I sell. Is Joy, Joy Lombardo, Joy the Clown, Lumpy's uh, mugshot. This was uh, the mugshot they took when Joey was on the lam in 2005, I think, 2006. Um, Dr. Patch Palatro snitched on Joey. The feds picked him up. He was hiding out in Elmwood Park at his good friend Dominic Calarco's house. Same Dominic Calarco, Frex, we used to call him Frex. World War II uh, hero. 
he used to run the Survivor Club. But this is my uh, my mugshot photo of Joe the Clown. Also, Alderman Fred Rohde from the powerful First Ward, First First War, excuse me, uh, from Bridgeport. I went to his trial, made member of the Chicago outfit. And on the back, his famous saying, vote for me and nobody gets hurt. And then last but not least, I got the uh, the old neighborhood t-shirts. Uh, this shows the old Grand Avenue neighborhood from, say, Grand and Halsted all the way to Grand and Western. Most of the action will, will was right there on Grand and Ogden. That was a hot spot right by Jimmy Kozo's compound, not too far from uh, – uh, Joey Lombardo's club, uh, other other clubs, the Bocce Club. They had a couple social clubs in the area back in the day. A lot of great restaurants, Como Inn. You got Salerno's. You got La, La Scarola, Richard's Bar, Bella Nota. But this is uh, this is my neighborhood, just west of downtown Chicago. So if you guys like any of these shirts, let me know. I'll probably get a uh, Joey Aupa shirt printed too. That's it though. Have a great weekend. Everybody be safe. Ciao.